So I hope that inspires you to come see the exhibition. I, I would say 90% of the things that Chloe showed you are on view in the gallery. So our next speaker is Jennifer Goff, curator of well, many things, Eileen Gray Furniture and the Musical Instrument Collections in the National Museum of Ireland's Decorative Art and History Division. She was a Fulbright Scholar to the United States from 2016 to 17, where she engaged in a lot of work, including research at the Avery Library um, on Stephen Hoyce and others related to Eileen Gray. Jennifer's dissertation on Eileen Gray was the basis of the book, Eileen Gray, Her Work and Her World, published by the Irish Academic Press um, in 2015. And today she will share her knowledge on Eileen Gray as a designer of rugs in a talk entitled From the Atlas Mountains to the Rue Visconti, Eileen Gray Rug Designer. Welcome, Jen. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you, Nina, for, um, and Chloe for letting me par be part of such an amazing project. I think all of us at some point, um, we've all said, we're all going to divorce Eileen Gray. Um, it hasn't happened. I unfortunately know uh, that I'm going to be an old woman in a, my wheelchair still looking for research with Eileen. So she's going to be part of my life. Um, and it's either I'm going to meet her either upstairs or down below when I, when I pass. Um, anyway, Eileen has been a greater part of my life. And um, literally in relation to her bugs and her, her artwork, they're very much interconnected. But... Um, from a student who studied at the Slade School in 1902 and then got permission to go on um, from her mother to study at the Ecole Colorossi and then at the Academy Julien. Uh, the Ecole Colorossi was not um, a very, um, how would I say, strict school. If the students couldn't afford uh, models, um, they um, often uh, used cadavers of people who had committed suicide at the Seine. So um, any of the drawings are, 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 that survive, which is the one that's here in the exhibition, um, is quite extraordinary. Eileen didn't think she was a good artist and she destroyed a vast amount of her early work. So this nude is a very competent drawing and you can get a chance to look at it. But what was really important with her art, or her art student years is that literally these were pivotal um, to Gray in continuing on her art studies, which as Chloe has eloquently put, she continued right up until she died at 98 years of age. So she came full circle. All throughout her life, um, Gray was fascinated by the different art movements. And by the time that she'd settled in Paris in 1906, she literally began straight away um, attending many art exhibitions, um, was completely drawn to the colours from Fauvism, uh, to the Cubist works of Pablo Picasso, André Lutz, uh, Sonia Delaunay. Um, she also was fascinated by the Russian constructive work. Um, Kazmi Malievich had a particular resonance with her especially in through to her carpet designs and also into her architecture. She also was fascinated by the futurist movement, especially Chloe had also noted about vorticism, uh, the idea of movement, uh, which constantly appears time and time again, not only in her carpet designs, but also in her furniture. She was a very clever lady and uh, we, we have a wonderful library um, that we've amassed from Eileen Gray and she had numerous manifestos and publications um, from all of these different movements and she also got many of the contemporary artists to sign and autograph their signatures to her. Um, I've had a wonderful time looking through these publications and just I wanted to get inside the head of Eileen Gray and the way to understand how she approached her carpet designs and much of her work it necessitated reading through these publications. Um, however she also had a vast number of publications in philosophy and I can tell you I'm definitely not a philosopher. She continued all throughout her life doing artworks and some of them cross over between carpet gouaches and also later artworks. So these are just a few of the examples um, of which some of them are on display in the exhibition and I do encourage you to go and have a look at them. As Chloe had said, uh, figurative work really didn't appear in her artworks. There's one in a later work that, we did of a that she did of a woman in front of a waterfall, which we've now discovered an early drawing. But as Chloe eloquently put from the film, um, she didn't want to do figurative works on her carpets because she didn't want to walk on people. So that's why many of her carpet designs turned out to be more abstract. However, in France at the time, there was a debate, uh, a big debate that was going on. There were two viewpoints. One, whether a decorative art was also art where they interlinked or was a decorative art and art separate. 
Um, Eileen Gray was of this particular opinion that decorative art, which ought not to be decorative, but means making new forms from old and sometimes new materials. Pottery, cork agglomeré, straw inventing. And this she'd written in a letter um, in 1964. It was the way she viewed everything. However, in relation to her carpet designs, Gray was very much drawn to the affinity of the work of the Nunica Werkstätten, who had been exhibiting in Paris from 1901. They were organized in such a way that they had appeared for a cultural wealthy family, but yet their work and their carpets were produced for a moderate household budget. The carpets on display in the exhibition in 1901 were criticized for their bulky forms, their acidic colors. However, the work showed French designers what was possible through a disciplined collaborative effort. Gray was very different to the, her French counterparts and had much more an affinity to the way that the carpets were being produced in Germany. She set up her workshop in the Rue de Visconti, along with Evelyn Wilde. Um, I found this particular photograph. There's only one very, very fluid photograph of Evelyn in um, Yudelanix's archives in the Smithsonian. And this is Evelyn with Kate Weatherby, who was um, very important for Gray in um, running her shop and also promoting her carpet designs. The Rue de Visconti workshop was incredible. It employed uh, 13 women. It had uh, four large looms and six uh, smaller looms. She employed all women. It was a, a very productive enterprise and it was one of the most important areas for Gray. Uh, during the 20s, um, the most active centres were both France and Germany. The French made by hand, which Gray really liked. She really wasn't looking to industrialise her carpets, which was quite unusual. In France, they also had wonderful experiments in rayon and in synthetic dyes. In Germany, they looked at chemical dye stuffs, which had developed. And Gray and Wilde were the very first who actually used natural undyed wools in their carpets. They also used uneven pile in the lengths of their carpets and they juxtaposed the yarns in, in the pile. Um, in L'Amour de l'Art, a critic had stated of their carpets, which they exhibited, the art of Eileen Gray retains the flavor of a wild and exotic fruit. Beige and brown, brown and gray, beige and black are her preferred harmonies. But she juxtaposes these lifeless tones with an intentional violence and severity that underscores the weaving methods. Several carpets offer two extremes in wool height, smooth in the customary manner and a central rectangle composed of a sort of lawn of interwoven wools. The effect is produced by uncut strands that are several centimetres long. The tangled wools recall the mane of some captive beast. It is the complementary effect the artist wanted for the shimmering wool, wood and sharp angles of her furniture. She also created carpets composed of bands where a dark band alternates with a light one. At the time, Gray really looked at uh, napless fabrics, which included tapestry weave and piled fabric, which included a knotted pile. She was all about knotted pile. The weavers worked from the back. They inserted the weft yarn in blocks of color, which corresponded to the pattern. The weft was then tightly packed down with a comb beater, which was then covered the warps. This is an example of an early rug, um, which we have in the National Museum of Ireland collection. It shows the uneven pile of wool. It also so shows how three or four different panels were attached together. Um, sadly, um, Gray didn't think much of this carpet. Um, her car got stuck one, um, one winter's evening in the snow and she used the carpet to uh, release the tires. So hence you can see it's, um, it's very well worn. Um, of the way that she worked initially, you have what was called a graph paper with a uh, point de So as you can see for Marie d'Abord and also for Klepp's carpets, it shows how each of the dots uh, show where each of the knotted piles were done. She also, in comparison to her contemporaries, was very, very different. Um, at the time, our deco rugs were really looking at tribal art, African, um, African art. Um, they were full of floral patterns, um, luxurious materials. Um, abstract um, ad abstract work, figurative work, and she's quite completely different when you look at the, the extent of her, of her career in carpet design. The early rugs from 1910 onwards have a very monotone kind of a colour. Browns and creams, um, blacks and browns, such as Zara, uh, which we also have in the National Museum of Ireland collection. From 1915 through to 1917, colour began to um, infiltrate into the works, especially in the rug Côte d'Azur, but she also began to design carpets that complemented pieces of furniture in her lacquer, such as this lovely rug that's called Poisson, which was illustrated in Vogue magazine. 
and it corresponded to a lovely lacquer table. You can see there, there's a big dish covered on top. So they worked in tandem with each other. And this is what happened initially when she began designing the rugs and then ventured into the world of interior design. The rugs were set to complement uh, the lacquer that was in the interiors for her clients. She was also all about the ideas of synesthesia, how touch, um, how touch, colour, sight, um, all kind of integrated to absorb you into a space to get you to interact with a particular object. And it was the same with her carpets the whole way throughout her career. For the rugs which she did for Madame Mathieu Levey in the Rue de Lota apartment, um, there were some of them were inspired by La Neg, um, this lovely African inspired rug with the, the rhinoceros horns. Others looked to Cubism uh, to complement the Cubist pieces that she did for the, for the apartment interior, such as Festoon. This is a, another one. This is the rug Cluny, which sat in front of a, a, it's actually sat on the back wall. It was a tonture hung on the back wall. And you can see this, these really wonderful, bright, vibrant colours. As Chloe has also indicated with many of uh, her artworks and her rug designs, there's coded messages. Um, she is an enigma. Some of the things we have managed to work out what they are. Um, that's when I say I will still be an old lady trying to work out many of their, her codes and what she's put into these rug designs. Many of her rugs were very popular with her clients and were sold through um, Jean Désert. As you can see in the window here, she was wonderful at doing window display. And this was the rug Vendigan. Um, in early drawings for uh, Jean Désert, there was the idea of how she could attract people to come in and uh, be curious about what was um, for sale in the shop. And one of the things that she had drawn was that at the edge of the window, there was a glass block that was supposed to have blue glass that would um, shine out towards, catch by the sun, and would draw viewers into the window. And there was the idea that you could look through down to the atelier to these, and you could see people working on carpets or working on, on her furniture. This actually never completely happened at the end when she designed Jean Désert, but it's a clever way that she was going to be able to get people to come in and integrate um, and interact, sorry, with um, the carpet designs or with the furniture that was for sale in Jean Désert. This is just to show you how some of the rugs that you have, this is at the top of the stairs. This is um, uh, Côte d'Azur, this lovely blue rug, and um, Irish green uh, was on display with some of her lacquer work, this lovely uh, screen that is in the Victoria and Albert Museum. So rugs, uh, lacquer work and objets d'art were all put together in the photographs that she took um, to entice people to see as a, a, a work ensemble. For the Monte Carlo room, um, as Chloe also um, highlighted, there was a particular rug that was in homage to Alistair Crowley. Um, she was uh, intrigued by Alistair because not only was he uh, the inventor of the religion of the Lima, he was also a known Lothario. Mina Loy had said um, to Stephen Hoyes that if any woman managed to escape the hands of Alistair Crowley in Paris at that time, they had a lucky escape. Um, however, I have to say, Thankfully, Eileen Gray did not um, was not seduced by him, um, but she was very intrigued by his ideas on black magic, occultism, and uh, it stayed with her all of her all of her life. And she had a large collection of his works in her library. So black magic was really done in homage uh, to Alistair Crowley. She also was employed by other designers to do rugs. Uh, Jean Roulman um, used her for the 1923 exhibition at the Salon des Artistes Décorateurs. And Robert Malley Stevens used her um, for Tarabos, which was uh, you can see here in the bedroom in the Villa de Noailles, 1928. There were variations of rugs. Uh, tango was in uh, black and cream, this lovely orange and brown, and then a white and black. There were also variations of Vendigan, uh, which is in blue, and there's a lovely, uh, lovely gouache of it here in the exhibition that's done in black and red. Um, this was done in homage to the, the Steel Group. She also did variations on Baribi, which is also in the exhibition, and it covers the uh, catalogue that uh, Irma has done on the edge of this wonderful catalogue. Um, very proud to say that Baribi is going to live on in legacy. And variations of Festoon, and they're also of Bobadilla. In E1027, it was all about uh, being participating in a journey. Invitation Voyage is what was on the mural of the wall of the living room. And indeed, the furnishings and rugs worked in tandem with one another. Um, the, the tapis called Centimetre came out of a, a, a rug design that was uh, called um, 
that's in the National Museum of Ireland collection, and it developed into this coded message of 10 uh, in relation to Jean Badovici, E1027, um, the, the architect of the client of the house. There are also variations on the tapis ronde that you see in the living room. Um, at the moment, I have counted up to 11 different variations, and each are more beautiful as the others. Some rugs worked in tandem or had echoes of the furniture. So the adjustable table with its lovely semicircular arc, you can see in this particular rug, which was in the bedroom downstairs in the house. And then also Marine uh, d'Abord, which sat on the terrace looking out towards the sea with this lovely life boy, the 10 for Jean, and the compass, which is indicating that you're part of this journey, which takes you through the house, out into the garden, and all the way down to the sea. Her tone had changed with the rugs that she included in Tom Papaya, uh, Tom Papai, sorry. Um, they were much more minimal. And at this time when she had created Tom Papai, it was not so much having things and objects out on display. It was paring back. It was becoming much more minimal. And I think this is the way her thought was also going in her furniture design at that time and also in relation to her architecture. The de Stiel group played a very important key role in her work. Um, in the Monte Carlo room, which was criticised by critics of the French critics of the time, as they described it as Dr Caligari's room of horrors, the de Stiel wrote to her and she became very good friends with J.J. Oud um, and uh, Jan Vils, who wrote about her along with Jean Badovici in the uh, publication Fendigen. Um, you can see there's numerous rogues are inspired by the de Stiel in the collection that we have in the National Museum of Ireland and also in the private collection um, that was with the late Peter Adam. She was also intrigued by the work of Kazmir Malievich and did numerous different designs on black square, white square. Okay. Um, lastly, there were, there were rug designs that were done um, in relation to architectural plans. Saint-Tropez was where her apartment was. It's a, an abstracted um, lines of the street. Castellar or Brentano was the rug that was done for Tampapaya and it's an abstracted site plan for the house. And also Tour de Nel, a little uh, 12th century tower that was just near her apartment in Rue Bonaparte. Lastly, it always comes back to Ireland. And it was a lovely thing that I had found because I thought she was an Irish emigre and had really walked away from her homeland. Gray had always wanted to come back to Ireland and she always wanted to have her work produced in Ireland. And she did numerous rugs such as Wexford, Ulisa, which was done in homage of James Joyce, who was reportedly a client. And she also trained two of Ireland's um, top Cubist painters, one of them by the name of Mamie Jellett and the other of Evie Hone. Evie wasn't very fond of Eileen because um, she said that Eileen was terrible for asking to borrow books and she never gave them back. Um, this is probably why Eileen has such a wonderful library. However, uh, Mamie Jellett um, was particularly fond of Eileen and we now know that she actually came and had her rugs designed and actually woven in the Rue de Visconti. And um, it's wonderful because Benny Jellett literally, along with Evie Hone, introduced Ireland to Cubism. And I really like to think that Eileen Gray played a key role in that. Benny Jellett's circular rug echoes um, Eileen Gray's tapis ronde. And um, it, it appears in, in Jellett's work over and over again. So lastly, um, her rugs did get produced in Ireland, along with Donegal carpets. It was a dream that she'd always wanted. And very sadly, this lovely little brochure was produced um, along with Castellar, Roquebrune, Bonaparte, Kilkenny and Saint-Tropez. But the year after the rugs were designed by Donegal Carpets, the company went bust. Um, it's typical in Ireland. <laughs> um, anyway, last but not least, she'd always said that she wanted uh, to come home to Ireland. And we were very fortunate that we got the collection in the National Museum. Um, and she did say to Joseph Reichwert um, in 1968 um, that she wrote to her niece, Prunella Clough, and she said, you did, tell, you did tell Joseph that I was Irish, which I preferred, um, and I hope you remember me for that way. Thank you very much. <laughs>